Hey guys, so this is the fifth video in my series on how to choose a SaaS pricing metric. And in this video, I wanna show you how to bring it all together. In the first video, I talked about operational viability, the ability to actually measure and use a pricing metric operationally. In the second video, I talked about how to measure value and demand. In the third video, I talked about expectation to pay, which is a technical term for, let's say the ability of a customer to associate fairness and cost transparency and sort of an equal footing and not regret the purchase. And in the fifth video, I talked about the concept of metric density, which is the variance in value of the unit that you're measuring. So the different value of users or the different values of API calls or the different values of hospitals or whatever it is that your pricing metric is. In this video, I wanna show you how I actually work with it and give you an insight on that. Okay, so here goes. The sheet I brought up here is my evaluation template that I use to send customers to start them on how to pick pricing metrics. So um, I'm just gonna walk through um, how it's set up and how you can use it. And I've actually, so I've made this Google sheet uh, viewable by anyone who has the link and I'll post the link in the video description below. So you can just go in, fetch it there and you know, create a copy for yourself and use it if you, if you like. So the idea is that you essentially first do a brainstorming exercise in the sense of, okay, I have a piece of software and we could price it by X. And in the video on uh, the value, uh, of a pricing metric, I talked about the concept of a value chain. So mapping out the value creation process of a customer from their cost inputs and resource inputs throughout the creation process until you get to an output. And that this can often be a good template for you to get an overview of all the different steps or elements in the value creation process. And at each step, you should be able to measure something. And usually that something can be a lot of different things, right? So um, at the beginning of a value chain, often we measure users um, and there can be you know, data inputs and outputs and API calls and templates activated or candidates hired or whatever it is that your solution does. So you, um, the way I've set this up is that there is, a, I've also sort of just you know, started to input an example over here. We'll work with that in, in a minute. But essentially what the first sheet here does is essentially is that you'll do something like this. So you'll say, okay, uh, we can say, I want to have users and I want hope. Let's say I go active users. And, you know, you get to maybe use the, either you know specifically what that is, but you can also do the node field here. So you can say for sort of uh, any set of active login credentials. Let's say uh, active users, and then you can say, um, any set of active locking credentials used with in the last 30 days, something like that. So you differentiate depending on the pricing metric. So I talked a little bit about this in the video on operational viability that you wanna be quite specific when defining a pricing metric because small details like this can determine how it's actually evaluated on the rest of the parameters and whether it will be measurable at all. So let's say you have users and then you ask yourself, okay, so step one, can I define it? Do I know what I mean when I say a user? You just said, well, it's a set of an active login credential. So it's a username and a password. Okay, so yes, I can define that. I can measure it. I can show it to a machine so that it can be automated. Okay, uh, and then can we actually measure it? Do we have access to that data? Can we legally measure it? Yes, we can also do that. Okay, for then, bam, I did, you know, this little script that says, okay, now you're operationally viable, right? If you select, any one of these like yes and no it's still no right then it is not operationally viable you need two yeses in order to get the yes on the operational viability so and and i've used this because i see people tweak this all the time like yeah yeah we can sort of measure it no no you can't either you can or you cannot there's no need to work with something that is hard at this step just pick something else okay so Let's say active users, yes, so we can also measure that. Okay, demand value. So does your 
customer actually want more of this, whatever it is in and of itself. And let's say we have something down here that we say, okay, um, I, uh, I, in the previous example thing on, on, in the value video, I had something like candidates hired, uh, and let's just assume that we can define what that means as well. Um, so let's say we're building an, uh, we're picking a pricing metric for an, an HR software solution where you, uh, pull candidates through some sort of, a a survey flow and you end up selecting them to fill vacant positions. Okay. Something like that. Okay. So the users would be the recruiters and the active users would be the, let's say the full-time recruiters that are always using it and not just the ones having login credentials in, in whatever the actual sort of situation of usage is. And this is something that is going to be specific to the situation and the customers you're selling to. Okay. So let's just run with this example. If you're building an HR software solution, does the recruitment companies that are buying it actually want more users? Not really, right? So they want to, they want their people to be able to use the solution, but essentially they just want the solution to work, right? And, and if it's a necessary input for the users to work the software to get it to work, okay, they want some users, but they would have the mindset that they would want the least amount of them, right? So we would go something like, yeah, is, it, is there no clear demand at all? Or is there a clear demand that they would really want to pull this solution from you? And this is not science, right? This is an evaluation format for you to say, well, is it a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five? And we can say, well, maybe this is a two. So not a lot of demand, but maybe active users is a three. So if we specify it a little bit tighter and say, well, you're not paying, you're at least not paying for the employees that isn't using the software. So you're not just paying the license, you're actually paying for the usage of the software. So you can give everybody a license and then you will only end up paying for the ones that actually use it a little bit better. But candidates hired, well, maybe that is the point of the software that, what, that we're selling them. So candidates hired would be clear demand. Like this is how we make money, right? So if you have a solution, you give it to me and you just charge me for the candidates I end up hiring, or we could also flip it and say, well, it's a, it's a vacancies filled. And um, I have clear demand for that. More vacancies filled is more money for me if I'm a recruiter. Okay, fairness, expectation to pay. So rewatch the video on, on this element, but, uh, but one that would be uh, applicable to users is that people just used to paying for users, like everybody charges user-based pricing. So it's almost a knee-jerk reaction for most customers to just accept it, which, which is different from them having demand for it that they want most of it, but they're not gonna push back on you charging per user, right? So this is, uh, this is high, this is a four or five, um, something like that, right? And, and actually you could argue that users, just the license is a five and the active users is a four, just because of the fact that people are a little bit less used to paying for active users. So they would have a little bit, uh, a few more questions regarding like, how does that work? Um, am I being tricked here? Um, and so forth. Where if they're just like, okay, I get a login credential and you know, if I use it, I use it. If I don't, I don't, but I pay for it anyways. Everybody knows that model. So their expectation to pay in that sense is high. Candidates hire, do they see a lot of fairness and expectation to pay? On that? Well, that depends on the specifics of the solution that we're modeling, right? If we are really delivering them a hired candidate through the solution, like they, we're actually, the solution does the job for them. And, and you can really specifically measure that this candidate was hired because of this solution. So it's not something like that we're affecting a lot of candidates and, you know, some of them are hired, but we can't really attribute it back to our solution, but we can make the case that we're helping it a little bit like sales training, right? So sales training, you know, you know, you can see that sales rise, but, but you can't point to any specific sale that was the result of the training. So there can be some, some fitting issues and so forth um, with some software, but let's say that this solution actually um, really delivers the candidate hired and we can be very specific about that. So we say, okay, fair enough. And then they have a very, a high expectation to pay in that. I'd actually be a five. Like, okay, you know, 
if you only charge before the candle is hired and you deliver it, perfect. Density. So is there any uh, variance in the value of a user being uh, paid for? So let's say are all users worth the same? Well, they're worth equally little, right? So it's because they're so early in the value chain. So they're actually not very close to the value generated. So it's not like it has poor density. But you could actually argue that the difference here is that active users might have a higher density. So active users might have, you know, uh, high density where users might have something like this, like a medium density, like some recruiters are better than others. Some recruiters work full time, other recruiters work only part time. So and so forth. Where candidates hired would also, depending on what software solution or let's say that we, we have a recruitment company that is both doing executive search and also doing like uh, staffing for part-time workers. So the executive search candidate hired is obviously worth hundreds of times more than the staffing of an hourly worker. But so it depends on what solution we're building. But let's say that we're only doing, doing uh, staffing for day-to-day uh, -day temp work, right? So it's 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 a it's a one-day job at the most. So most of these candidates would have a very similar um, density. So it's not perfect, but it's high. So we do something like this before. Okay. So as you can see, we start to have a little bit of a mapping on this where the individual pricing metrics start to score on these parameters in different ways. And they have pros and cons, right? So we can say, well, is there a clear you know, winner in the value category? Yeah, so in this candidates hired would be really good. Is there a clear fairness expectation to pay um, winner? Well, users have a high score, they all have a high score, right? So, so not really, they're on equal footing there, but none of them are disqualified because of this aspect. What about density? They have, none of them sort of knocks it out of the park, but they have sort of good or medium all of them. So, but across, it seems that with the narrating and the choices I just made for candidates hired, it seems that that would be the clear winner here, right? So, and you know, if if, the, if we had the example with the executive search and the um, the all the staffing, maybe this the density would have been quite low, right? So we would have this situation. So then we would have to evaluate. Okay, so what are we going for? Should we then? maybe go back in our packaging and sort of pull out the executive search as a specific product so that the core product that only does staffing can actually have a higher density on the metric and we can price it or monetize that solution better. So these are some of the back and forth uh, situations you can have between the pricing model and the packaging, depending on what kind of issues you face at this stage. But let's just say that this was sort of an easy case in the sense that we could evaluate each of the metrics like this and then score them accordingly, and then look at it and say, okay, so it seems that candidates hired, from our perspective, when we're designing the pricing model internally in the company, looks to be the winner, right? So we would assume that candidates hired would be executable in the market, that customers would appreciate paying for candidates hired, that they would get it and not have a lot of pushback or friction towards it, and that it would monetize the value we bring rather well. Good. Next step would then be to evaluate it and actually validate it with customers. So we actually take the, so we build a pricing model around candidates hired for the solution. And then we go and show it to customers just in a PowerPoint format and say, hey, you know, we're gonna sell you, you know, we have a basic and advanced and a premium tier and some add-ons or whatever, and we're gonna charge you based on candidates hired. What do you think about that? And then if the customer has issue with it, they're going to push back on it. They're going to tell you, well, you know, we have no idea what a candidate hired is. We can't define it. It's like, oh, okay, so that's a problem. Then everything falls. You can't use a candidate hired. But customers can give you a reality check on it and say, based on these things, you know, there can be a discussion along these parameters. Is it something that you would want? Would you want more of it in and of itself? Are you, are you, do you think it's a fair way to price? You don't ask them, do you expect to pay for this? But but fairness is the is the right term in an interview format to use here. So, and you would say, if you're drilling for feedback on the density metric, you say something like, is there a relatively sort of stable value across these units, across the candidates hired or whatever is the metric is? Um, 
And you just ask this question when you're trying to validate it with customers. But if all of these checks out, it's going to work. I've never not seen it work. If you actually hit all of these four parameters of a pricing metric, you show it to customers and they agree that it is, there's no fifth metric that I've found at least that is going to make it sort of not work. Does this mean that it is the best one? No, because you know, you might have come up with something else here uh, down at number four on the list that was even better, right? That had even more um, market fit with your customers that they got even more. So you never know. So the, the design exercise essentially is to try and find a metric that works, not to find the best one or the optimal one, but you come up with a lot of suggestions and a lot of solutions and spend a little time on that. And then you try to evaluate and to throw things out. Then you make a educated guess. You then build a model on it, take it to customers, talk to them, hear what they think. This is a super easy approach and it should take you half a day to come up with, I usually come up with like 20, 30, 40 pricing metrics. And then once we start working with them, we, you know, we, we define some of them a little bit more clearly and, you know, create new ones and iterations on the existing ones. And then we just start to evaluate them and it don't get hung up in, oh, is this is three or four and so forth. If, if you're in doubt, as I did when I walked you through this, start to compare them. Like, is this higher or lower than this other one? And you, because essentially what you want is a rank ordering. So you want to sort all the pricing metrics on each of these specific parameters according to each other in order for you to choose between them, which is the point, right? So you have all the ideas and then you try to choose the best one. And this essentially is just a set of, let's say, crutches or checklists that helps you work through the process and ask some specific questions that might trip you up later when you try and push it to the market, right? But, and as always, the customer is the final judge on whether it works or not. So don't skip the validation, hashtag. So this is the model that I use. And um, as I said, this Excel sheet is, is a, you know, is viewable for anyone with the link and I'll post the link in the video description below. So you can just go in and create your own copy. And um, if none of this made sense to you, it's probably because you didn't watch the four videos where I explain each of these categories uh, one by one. So you can do that. They're here on the YouTube channel. And you know maybe I'll also post uh, links uh, to them in the video description of this one. So um, I hope it makes sense to you. I hope it's, it's useful. I've, I've built this and used it in, I don't know, 40 commercial redesigns. Um, across both ACVs of, you know, a few hundred bucks a year for a solution to literally multi-million dollars a year solutions. So it's probably going to work for you too. All right. Take care.